Take your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I thought I was done with this part of it. We're looking at the weapons of warfare that God told us to use, the whole armor of God. And we've been preaching a series on that. I, The last two Sundays, I preached two messages on the shield of faith. Thought I was done with it and um, realized after looking at some things that I wasn't, I wasn't done. And I'm going to try to explain some things to you this morning about how the spiritual realm works. Do you believe in God? One person in a church. I heard one person in a church say they believe in God. Do you believe in God? That's better. Do you believe in angels? Does he give his angels charge over us? Of course he does. That's scripture. That, in fact, that's what the devil tried to tempt Jesus with. He said, go ahead and jump. Angels will catch you. And Jesus said, uh, I know my father. You don't tempt him. That's why we don't handle snakes in this church either. Okay? Do you believe in devils? You should. Because some of you have been fighting them all week. And I don't know anything about you from this last week. I don't know one story. I just know me. And I know I've been fighting them. All week. And they hit pretty hard. Lisa and I are, we've been praying, we're getting our passports renewed. We're going to go back to Kenya, if the Lord allows. And um, we're looking forward to that. Ministering to the people in Samburu, they are such beautiful people. And I love their worship. I love to hear them sing. And man, they put everything they got into it. And I miss the people. We're going to try to go to Turkana again. And spend more than just a day out there. Try to be an encouragement to the pastors out there and the people. But I know in places in Kenya... There are spiritual strongholds. Let me explain what that means. Since the, since who remembers the Cuban Missile Crisis? You remember, okay? And what happened was Cuba became a communist nation. That was an immediate threat to the United States of America. And then they worked out a deal with Khrushchev. Khrushchev was sending nuclear rockets and was going to base them in Cuba. And that was an act of war. It was a serious threat. And I guess by the grace of God, the Soviets backed down right at the end and pulled their missiles back. But what I found funny about the, the Cuba is an island all by itself out there in the Gulf of Mexico. And I didn't know this, but we have one of our number one marine bases in Cuba, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Now that to me is funny because this nation that hates America, communist nation, has been our enemy for years. And yet we've got a piece of their ground that we ain't given back. That's called a strategic position. Amen? So if Cuba ever starts anything with us, we've got some good old boy Marines down there right in their backyard that can handle it. That's called a stronghold. You understand that? Everybody listening to me today, the enemy has a piece of you using it as a stronghold against you. Do you understand that? It's like us having that little piece of ground there in Cuba that we're not about to give up. 
And the Cubans better not mess with us because we got that there. The enemy has in your life a stronghold. And with some people it's this, with some people it's that. But it's there in everybody's life. And it's going to be there until the day you die. Now, I don't know what your area of weakness is. I don't know what part of your life the devil has parked his soldiers in. But every now and then, you're going to have to deal with them. Because they hit, and they hit pretty hard. They've hit me multiple times. And I don't, I'm nobody. I'm no, I'll say it this way. I'm not any different than any of you when it comes to that. I'm not stronger than you. I'm not better than you. I'm not more holy than you. I'm not more spiritual than you. I'm exactly like you. And the devil has little pieces of Mike Hoggard's territory. And he uses them against me every now and then. So as I'm preaching through this series on the breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, sword of the spirit, shield of faith. As I'm preaching on these things, God is showing me how I have to have these in my life. And if I don't have them, the devil's going to walk right over the top of me. And I'm not going to make it. That's just how I see things. What I'm telling you is, devils are real. And they are, there are some, more than likely, in this very place today. How many of you believe that? Now, you've heard some of the stories. I've never seen it, nor have I ever heard it. But several people in this church have told me, that when they are here, sometimes by themselves, they will see things and hear things. Bad, evil stuff. I've never seen it. But I'm not going to call the people who have a liar. Because I believe it. I believe it happens. Okay? Now, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that this church is going to hell and we're all sinners and none of us are saved. It's just that wherever the saints are, that's where the enemy is going to be gathered to. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. I'm going to show you something here in a minute. And you can believe it or not. But I'm telling you, this Bible is right. And this Bible shows us the spiritual world that we cannot see with our physical eyes. We may not be able to hear it with our ears. But we can know it as sure as you know you're sitting in this church today. You can know the, the devil. You can know the enemy. You can know when their presence is there. You, and you can find out what to do about it when they are. Ephesians chapter 6. Are you there? Say amen. Put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And let me say something. I'm going to take this kind of slow today. Is that okay? Okay? I'm going to do more teaching than I am anything. Lisa, on the way over this morning, Lisa told me, she was looking on Facebook in the Bethel Church group. Somebody had posted that some rap star, I don't remember his name. I wouldn't know him if I saw him. But he's come out with a, his own line of shoes. Very expensive shoes. And there's something about Satan and 666 all over them. In other words, it's just blatantly obvious. Who's seen that? Anybody? So am I telling it right? JJ, am I telling it right? What's that guy's name? Whatever. His real name's probably Marion Schwartz or something like that. But that doesn't sound rapper enough. But he's got a pair of tennis shoes that's obviously satanic. And if I catch anybody in this church wearing them here, 
Well, just remember that David carries a gun, okay? Yes, David. That's wicked. Literally six cc's of human blood injected into the shoes themselves. That's evil. Now, see, we can look at that and say, well, that's obvious, right? It's not the obvious stuff that I'm concerned about. It's the subtle stuff that worries me. It's not the devil I know. It's the devil I don't know. What did God say about Satan? Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And if you look there at, in, in Ephesians 6, 10, or verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He, ha he works and operates secretly behind the scenes so that you can almost never catch him before he attacks. Now I say almost never, sometimes God will make you aware of it. But sometimes he'll slip up out of nowhere and get you. And that's what you've got to, that's why you should never be without your breastplate of righteousness. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Your loins gird with truth. Amen? You should never be without it because you never know when he's going to show up. So he says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, verse 12, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore. Let me give you another illustration. If you were in the forest by yourself on a hike and happened upon two, three, five wolves, what should you do? Can you run from wolves? They run faster than you. But see, you have, an adva you have a built-in advantage. You are larger than they are. God made us to be upright. And there's a spiritual lesson in that. Beasts have to crawl. Man stands upright. Man stands. What did God do to the devil after he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden? What did he do to him? Yes. He took his legs off of him, didn't he? He said, you're going to crawl on your belly. The devil can never, ever stand. But you can Keep that in mind. What did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do on the day that everybody was supposed to fall before the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up? What did they do? They just stood. They didn't make a big scene. Oh, we're God's people. They didn't do nothing. They just stood. And on that day, it was obvious who was on God's side and who wasn't. Wasn't it? All you had to do was look. There's three men. Everybody else is falling. There's a falling happening right now. The falling is taking place right now. It's happening in our country. It's happening in churches. Churches. Marrying sodomites. Having sodomites in leadership positions in the church. And think nothing of it. Falling right, right and left. Here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they said, you might kill us, but we're not going to fall before that. They had their armor on. And that's what he's, that's all he's asking you to do is stand. Stand for what's right. Stand for the truth. And don't back down. So you got these wolves standing there. What the wolves want is for you to start running. Because if you run, they'll come after you. They'll bite your, at your heels and get you to fall. Now who has the advantage? You or the wolves? The wolves. They automatically, it is in their nature. They instinctively know where a neck is. And they go right for the neck. Notice that God did not put anything, no bones or nothing here to cover your arteries and your windpipe. It's exposed. And that's what they'll go for every time. And you're dead. But you see, all the way back in Genesis 9, 
God put a fear in every creature of man. Did he not? Squirrels run away from us. Fish swim away from us. Bears, even bears, don't like the scent or the image of a man. They don't like it. They, their first instinct is not to attack. Their first instinct is to run. Because God put that in them. Now, in this case, since we're dealing with devils and they are more powerful than us, we don't have an advantage over them unless the man is with us. You know who the man is? Say his name. Jesus Christ. Are they afraid of him? You better believe it. He can throw them in the pit and they know it. And any place where Jesus is, you can stand your ground there and those devils will flee. What did Jesus tell us? Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. See how simple this stuff is? Now, that's what he told us. He told us to stand. In order to do that, take on you the whole armor of God. Verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is where we are right now. Above all, this one thing, this is why I, I think I've preached three sermons now on it already. This seems to be important enough. Apparently God's trying to get it across to me or he's trying to get it across to you. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Wherewith, faith in what? The Bible. You either believe it or you don't. It's that simple. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, I mentioned in the first sermon on this, some of the fiery darts. And I don't know why I didn't think of it two weeks ago. I don't know why I didn't think of it Last week, but God made sure I thought about it this week. Because I'm going to explain to you those fiery darts and why the Bible uses that kind of language. Fiery darts, not just darts. They're fiery darts. When God describes something that way, He's connecting it with its definition in the Bible. We know the devil has a lot of tools and a lot of weapons that he uses against us. One thing that we know for sure that he has with him is one third of all of the angels in heaven he has with him on his side. Now, how many angels is that? The Bible says the number of angels cannot be counted. They are innumerable. So let's just say there's a lot. More, let's say that there's more bad angels than there are humans that have ever lived on the earth. And there's 7 billion of us on here right now. That's a lot of bad guys. That's a lot of bad angels. He has one third of them. And let me show you something. Turn to Psalm 104. I want you to see this in your Bible. I want you to underline it. I want you to mark it. I want you to where when you flip your Bible open, it opens to this page. And God's going to give you some understanding. Why did he say fiery darts? Now, while you're turning there, I do not want to tell this. Before you shake my hand, I'll hand sanitize, okay? I do not want to tell this. <clears throat> you remember first time I went to Kenya. The first night out, I mean, the devil fought us. Every, every plane ride he fought us. Every minute he fought us. And my first night laying there in Pastor Omondi's compound, he graciously let us stay at his place. 
I'm trying to get some sleep. I got to preach the next day in Kibera, which is the about the second largest slum in the world. And those people were so good to me. But I'm laying there in bed and I'm trying to get some sleep. I'm exhausted. And I'm hearing, I am hearing, not in my ears, in my spirit, get out, get out, get out. You don't belong here. Get out. You're in danger. Get out. You're going to die. Go home. Leave. I listened to that for hours. And it nearly drove me out of my mind. And that didn't let up. I preached in, in Kenya for a week. And then we just took some time to see some sights in Nairobi after that. They did not let up on me until we got back to America. And I said, that, that was 2011, and I said at that time, I am never going back there again. Never. And then when I went to preach with Brother Mike Hutzel, Brother Brent Hutzel, same thing happened. My wife will tell you I called her, and it was on a Sunday. I was supposed to be preaching that morning, and I couldn't do it. I've been preaching all week out in Kilimambogo. I was supposed to preach that morning. I couldn't do it. I couldn't even get out of bed. And I told my wife, I said, they're supposed to leave tomorrow. We're supposed to go to Megori, Kenya. I said, I'm not going. I'm going to stay here all week. I'm not getting out. I'm not leaving. I'm not going out there. She prayed for me. I went out there. I fought the devil all week. I'd go preach and I'd say, Mike, take me back to the hotel. Get me out of here. It was, I, I mean, it was, it was bad. It was rough. I have told you that I'm finding that the older I get, I am not as strong emotionally as I used to be. I can't carry weights, burdens like I used to. Things... So much has happened in the last several years that it's just, it's, it's, it's like, a, like a dog or a horse being gun shy. And the devil knows it. And he can throw fiery darts at me and knock me out of the saddle pretty quick. So, if you were watching... Thursday, Pastor Mike online, I no more than got started talking, wham, and somebody that I talked to after that said, I could tell something was going on. I, something hit me and I went into an anxiety panic, I couldn't think. I couldn't hardly talk. And the only thing that I knew to do was shut the cameras down. And I did. I wasn't on there a minute. And I just sat there going, what was that? I'm telling you, this stuff's real. If you've ever been hit by a devil, you know it. Or maybe you don't know it, but I'm trying to explain it to you. It's real. And it's evil. And the devil can knock any one of us down. Don't think that you're too good and you're too strong to where it won't happen to you. Because as sure as you do, God will let it happen to you. Let him that standeth take heed lest he all. In Psalm 104, verse 3, this is, God's going to describe something. Who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. Now he's describing angels and what he made them out of. Who maketh his angels spirits, so any kind of angel, doesn't matter if it's a good one or a bad one, they are spirits, which means 
that bullets and knives and uh, grenade launchers and atomic bombs won't hurt them. You cannot fight spirits with carnal weapons. Amen? You can't do it. It won't work. He maketh his angel spirits, his ministers, a flaming fire. Now, what did we just read from Ephesians? To quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. This is the devil shooting devils at you. They are fiery ministers. And it said ministers. Now that may sound strange to you. But let me tell you about what I know about the devil. God uses him. Do you believe that? He does. Think of Pharaoh. Why did God raise up Pharaoh? Why didn't Pharaoh just say, okay, God, after the first plague, God, you can have them. Why didn't he say that? God kept hardening his heart every time he had a plague. It took 10 of them. Then it, then it took the killing of the firstborn. Finally, God released Pharaoh to release the Israelites. And Paul tells us that God used Pharaoh to show forth his mighty power. Now, if you ever want to see God's mighty power in your life, you just wait around until the devil bangs you upside the head and knocks you down. And you'll see God lift you up in a way that he, you've never had it happen before that way. And you'll worship God. I guarantee you, you'll praise God for that. Guarantee you, you will. He maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. Now, think of these fiery darts now. They're not just things. These are devils. That God allows Satan to fire at you. Why? To cause you to rely only on Jesus. Because what do we do nine times out of ten? Try to rely on ourselves. And I'm telling you, it won't work. Thursday, I could no more talk and overcome that than I, that I could stand right now. I could not say a word. That's happened before. Behind his pulpit. Don't be surprised if it happens again. Because it probably will. For whatever reason, I'll let God worry about it. I just know it happens that way. So think of these arrows now as devils. In fact, let me read these verses to you. Job 6, for the arrows of the Almighty are within me. The poison whereof drinketh up my spirit. The terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. Look at that verse. Now, who attacked Job? Who attacked Job? Satan. But who did Job say was the cause of it? The Almighty, God. And let me tell you, if God didn't allow it to happen, it wouldn't have happened, would it? Is the devil ever stronger than our God? No! A million times no! There must be some reason why God is allowing the devil to spar with you, to aim arrows at you, to try to bring you down. There's some lesson or there's something that God is doing in your life to make you better, stronger, faster. I sound like the six million dollar man. We can make him better, stronger, faster. There's something that God is doing that's going to end up being better for you than it was last year. And isn't that what you want? Amen. The arrows of the Almighty are within me. The poison whereof drinketh up my spirit. And I want to tell you something. Those are poison arrows he sends. Those fiery darts are full of poison. You know what those, you know what those, you know what poison is? It's the lies that the devil tells us. You can't, Mike, you, you can't preach. Mike, you're not saved. Mike, you don't deserve working at Bethel. Mike, you're no good. 
and tell me all kinds of things that poison inside your mind, inside your spirit, and you're just fighting it. Drinketh up my spirit, the terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. Psalm 11. For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may, look at this word, privily. You know what that word means? Secretly. Shoot at the upright in heart. Now, the upright in heart is everybody here, everybody listening to me, who wants to go to heaven when they die. And you know God has saved you. You know God. You know you're born again. You know you're right with God. But watch this. Do you not have secret sins? Do you not have them? I'll just go ahead and say, you have them. I'm not asking, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to stand up and tell us. And I ain't telling you mine. But you got them. Look at that verse. That they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. Everybody. Everybody. Has got some kind of secret. That they don't want anybody to find out about. Whether it's pride, lust, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. No matter what it is, everybody here has got one. And that's that fiery dart that God lets the devil shoot at you to try to destroy you. But if you belong to God, will it work? Milton? No. Nope. But he can sure make you think he can do it. Say amen to that. Psalm 18. Yea, he sent out his arrows. These are verses that God gave me on the way over to church this morning. He sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Now I want you to, what does lightning look like? Is, there, is it a straight line? Do you ever see straight line lightning? It's kind of like... Like a serpent. That's his lightning. Do you believe that... Do you believe in fiery flying serpents like the Bible says? No, seriously. Because I'm going to get weird on you in a minute. You better get ready. Do you believe that there exist fiery flying serpents? Okay, we're getting there. They don't just exist in the Bible. They exist now. And they're devils, aren't they? And why are they fiery? Because that's what they're made of. So that tells you. When, when God sent the fiery serpents among the Israelites who complained to God about having to read the Bible again, because that's in essence what they were doing. They were complaining about the manna, which was God's bread for them, and they got sick of it. Maybe that sounds familiar to you. Maybe one day you went looking for something better than the Bible. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't exist. I've been there. And it doesn't exist. God dealt with me not too long ago about how much time I was spending reading what was on the internet versus how much time I was spending reading this. And I'm telling you, there's nothing better than this. So, you believe in fiery, flying serpents, correct? And they're devils, right? They're bad. That's his arrows. That's his lightning arrows that he shoots out. Psalm 57. 
I'm telling you, it's going to get weird in a minute. Just hang on to me. Some of you are going, oh, I love it when Mike gets weird. <laughs> my soul is among lions. How many of you ever been there? Raise your hand. Been in a lion's den. And I lie even among them that are set on fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. What do you think he's saying here? Their teeth are arrows and their tongue is a sharp sword. What do you think he's saying? He's talking about what people say to you who work for the devil. Do you know what it takes to be an agent of Satan? It doesn't take a ritual. It doesn't take a secret handshake. It doesn't take eating some kind or drinking some kind of drug or anything like that. According to Ephesians 2, all it takes is being lost. Because the prince of the power of the air is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So your family member and your friend and your neighbor and the people that you work with that are lost, don't be surprised when they turn on you. Because they will. So now, look at that. Even the sons of men. We're talking about people now who have a spirit in them. And it's not a good spirit. And the devil that is in them causes them to say things to you. To destroy your faith. To destroy your trust. And if you don't have that shield of faith. You're out. It'll be, adios, Bethel. Don't look for me to be back, because I ain't coming back. You started believing the devil's lies. And I've been here long enough that I can tell you it happens. I've been here almost all my life. And I've seen people come in, act churchy, and then out. What happened? A neighbor, a family member, a wife, a husband, a child, a grandchild, a mom, a dad, a co-worker, a preacher, tried to drive them out of God's house. And it worked. Their teeth are spears and arrows and their tongues a sharp sword. It's the things that they say. Now turn to Numbers 21. It's fixing to get weird now. So I'm going to show you a picture of something. You want me to wait on you? I'm just, I'm just teasing you. You go ahead. Numbers 21. This is where God sent the fiery serpents in. And the Bible with the word fiery, this is God telling you these were not ordinary under the rock snakes. These are not rattlers. They weren't anacondas. Did I say that right? Anacondas? They weren't pythons. They weren't coral snakes, king snakes, black snakes. They were devils. Devils. And the people spake against God and against Moses. And when you said, Ah, there's nothing in that Bible for me today. You just spoke against God. You just did it. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul... And it, ask yourself the question, was this true? And the answer is yes. God led them to a place where there was no, there was no fruit trees. There was no deer running around. For 40 years... We know two things happen. We know that number one, every day except the Sabbath, the people of Israel had to get up and go out and gather manna to eat. And where did they get their water from? For 40 years, where did they get their water from? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, the rock that followed them was, see, that rock, when Moses struck the rock and water came out, according to Paul, that wasn't just a one-day thing. The 1 Corinthians 10 tells you that that rock 
followed them everywhere they went, and that rock was Christ. So they were in a place, number one, where there was no natural resources for food and no water. God was forcing them to depend on Him every single day. And God will do that to you if He loves you. How many of you can say amen to that? Because haven't you tried to find water and bread somewhere else? I'll admit it. I have. I'll be honest and tell you I have. And I starved to death. And then I remembered I had plenty of water and plenty of food right here. And I'm getting to the point where I need it. More now than I ever have in my life. There's no bread, neither is any water. Our soul loathed this light bread. They said, we hate reading the Bible. Ch I'm telling you, church after church has abandoned this Bible. So ask yourself the question. If a church cast aside the manna from heaven, according to this place in the Bible, what does God send to them? Fiery serpents. And I'm here to tell you, believe it or not, there are people in this world, including churches, who think the fiery serpents are better than the manna. And I can prove it. I actually have a picture of it, if you believe me. It's going to get weird. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. These are devils. And they bit the people. So it wasn't something that earthly medicine could fix. It's something that only God could heal it. And they bit the people and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. You see, when you start watching what happens to other people who walk away from the Lord, it should scare you. It should scare you at what God turns people over to who choose to walk away from his manna and his water. And you look on their lives and it should scare the death out of you to where you go back to God and say, God, please don't do that to me. God, I'm scared. God, I don't want to die like that. That should scare you. We have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Now that is a shield of faith right there. Because the brazen serpent, all they had to do was just believe what Moses told them about it. That if they looked on it, God would heal them of the poison of the serpent. Those devil, fiery serpents. God would heal them of that poison. Now let me ask a question. Is there anybody here that God saved you, but you used to be in some weird new age religion or something like that? Is there anybody like that here? Really? Oh, David, David. David told me stories in my office the other day. I'll let him tell them to you. He got into some wacky stuff. Does he want to go back? All they had to do was believe. 
And that's what Jesus meant when he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever, what was the word? Believeth in him should not perish. Our salvation and God's blessing in our life comes from our belief and not our deeds. Now, do you see that? Good, because I've got to tell you the story. God called me into a ministry of a watchman. Uh, 2000, no, 1997. And God's had to show me things from the Bible, show me things out in the world. I read a lot of books. I read a lot of things that you would not even know about. And it has helped people because there are people from all different wacky, weird religions that are now watching us now and consider themselves to be part of Bethel because I spoke on some things and God showed me where it was in the Bible and it made sense to them and they said, yeah, that's, that's what I saw. That's what I used to be. That's how I used to be. Do you still believe that devils are real? And believe it or not, there are people who want these devils to come and possess them, take over them and rule their life because they think that these devils are beneficial to them, that they are benevolent creatures, that they are going to bring the world into a new age where there's going to be no more wars, no more banks stealing money from everybody, no more crooked politicians. All children are going to have plates full of food to eat. There's not going to be any more crime. There's not going to be any more. There's going to be one happy family world government and everybody's going to be happy. They actually believe this. Now, people from different areas call them different things. So the New Agers, they call them the Ascended Masters. They believe that up in the heavens, there are these people, and Jesus is one of them, according to them, that, and they're waiting the time when they're going to come down and bring this world peace and harmony. But we have to bring ourselves up to their level in order to receive them. And so they are teaching New Age doctrines, New Age teachings. They're teaching them in schools. They're teaching them. They're teaching them in churches. Don't do yoga. Thank you. You know what the, you know what the word yoga means? Yoke. That's what it means. Because the teaching is that you bring yourself into a place where you can yoke yourself together with a God. A God. So that you can be a God. What was the first lie right out of the devil's mouth? You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Then there's guys like Stephen Greer. Some of you may have heard me talk about him. Stephen Greer was a man who grew up in a broken home. His dad was an alcoholic. His mom was crazy. So he really kind of raised himself. He goes to school. He's very smart. He goes to college out in North Carolina. While he's in college, he sees these guys. They're all meditating. And he wonders what it is. He learns a little bit from them. And he's starting to meditate. And, he, and he's hearing voices. He gets real bad sick and he's about to die because he has no money for a doctor or anything like that. And he is going to die into his room came down these things. He calls them aliens. And let me tell you what the Bible calls them. Aliens. Strangers. Devils. Because that's what they are. And he, they healed him. He overcame his disease within 24 hours. He was, he was alive the next day. And he would go out every weekend, out in the wilderness, out in the forest somewhere, and call down these benevolent, angel, ascended master, alien, and their ships. He quit his... Work as an ER physician. That's how smart you. You got to be a really smart guy to be an ER physician. 
he quit his work being an ER physician and he started working with government people to bring in a time when the American public no longer saw the UFO alien thing as a threat or as a bad thing, but that these people are coming to make us a better race of people so we can join the star people. I told you I was going to get weird. Now, I cannot begin to tell you how big this is. Just because you don't research this doesn't mean it doesn't exist. They're, they actually did a poll that came across this last night. More people in this country believe in aliens than believe in God. Did you know that? That happened right underneath our noses. So Greer holds, their seances is what they are, he holds uh, little group gatherings and he calls them close encounters of the fifth kind. It's human initiated contact. You can go to his YouTube channel. Just about every time, he'll have 20 people out in the desert or out on a beach somewhere or in the woods on a mountain and they're all sitting around saying mantras and they're doing stuff that Indian gurus did a thousand years ago and we're calling down these Indian gods. There's 330 million of them, by the way. And call these, and just about every time they do, UFOs show up. Now, what does that tell you? These are not the Vulcans who are listening in with their tricorders. These are spirits. So he holds this event. He got all these people gathered around. And he snapped a photograph. You see that long white thing there? That is a fiery flying serpent. There's a close up. See the serpent head on it? Looks like an arrow, doesn't it? They tell you the poison snakes are the ones with the diamond shaped heads, like a arrow. These people wanted this to come to them. They asked for it and they got it. And these people are your neighbors, your co-workers. They call them up there on the top left, that's a, they call it a light being. Those are devils. And what they did to the children of Israel was kill 20 some odd thousand of them in one day. But now the world is changing and they're calling these things our benefactors and our friends and this whole world is about ready to turn over to following after these devils we're going to be surrounded in fact we already are now you can, that you can believe that's a real picture or not it's been looked at it's been analyzed it's a digital image of a fiery flying serpent and I'm telling you, they're just as real as you and I sitting here right here today. In fact, they're more real. Ezekiel, he said, when I shall send them, when I shall send upon them the evil arrows of famine, which shall be for their destruction and which I will send to destroy you. And I will increase the famine upon you and will break your staff of bread. Now, I'm going to leave you with this. When God uses the word famine. What is he talking about? He told Amos, I will send you a famine, not of bread, not of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. The last two sermons, I've tried to convince you that the only way to have a shield of faith and the only way to have faith in the Bible is you must read the Bible. Faith cometh by and hearing by the Word of God. I'm convinced, I'm convinced that daily 
I must spend time with God in my Bible. You say, well, pastor, all the stuff you do, surely you do. Sometimes I just give out for everybody else and don't take in for me. And I've gotten to a point now where I recognize I can't give no more out until I've taken in for me too. When we feed the people in Kenya, Michael always asks uh, the people that work at our radio station that passed out the food, can they have some of that too? Yes. By all means, yes. What good would it do to feed 2,000 people and the people who fed them go hungry? Right? What good does it do for you to try to be a Christian testimony to your friends who have that in them? The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What good would it do for you to try to be a Christian witness to them to change their life if you are not yourself changed? What good would it do for you to feed everybody if you yourself was starving to death? Did I make my point clear? I didn't get too weird on you, did I? Listen. Trust me. We don't see this stuff every day in America because it's sub rosa. It's like under the carpet. But I'm telling you, the forces of evil that are in this nation are becoming so strong that their presence is going to be both seen, heard, and felt everywhere. And you're going to know it's real. I promise you, you will.